Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be back. I'm just taking you all in here. <laughs> I've been away for, God, since before Christmas. I haven't really been away, but past sometimes away. But away from and other people who've been doing this wonderfully well. One of my closest friends, an uh, old friend from med uh, medical, who uh, runs medical systems and stuff. We worked together long ago, different universities. And uh, she said, I came on to see you, but other people were on. And it was great. So that's just as good. <laughs> I don't know that. Oh, good. Tess and uh, Allison and and uh, Jesse were doing a good job. So hi, welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice thing. People from far places, I see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so good. So, um, I suppose, look, you know what we do? Let's sit a little bit, eh? Um, and uh, so just for, you know, uh, what is it What is it like to be here? What is it like to be you? <laughs> so that's a mysterious question when I ask that. And uh, I mean, to me, it's mysterious. What is it like to be me? <laughs> but it's nice. It's a nice question. In a way, that the question sort of, um, the question does well um, by us. Um, as the great con path is, um, you know, answers are a dime a dozen, but a good question is hard to find. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, what, what is it like to be you? Feeling the time, what is it like to be in our time here? Yeah. What is it like to be together and see faces that, you know, I haven't, I haven't seen some of you for a while. And it's nice, nice to see you. Like seeing your faces and your names come up. It's like the names of the Buddha, yeah, come up. Ah. Donna and Deborah and Dawn and Asneen and Dolly and Lonnie and Bob Mullen and Tess and all the names, all the names of the Buddha. Ah, you can't hear the bell, Tess says. I know why. I forgot to put my original sound back on. Let's try this again. <laughs> How's that? Thumbs up from everybody. <laughs> it's nice I get to ring the bell twice. <laughs> the sound of the ancient temple bell. Inside the bell, you know, when we hear something, there's just, just we just hear, right? You know, there's no, um, there's nothing to be added to it, really. You know, we're just hearing the bell, and the universe opens out inside the bell sound. So the um, you're so the important thing is just to feel the time and not be running around somewhere else. Quick, can I check my phone? 
Um, <laughs> my phone will tell me if I'm being here or not. <laughs> but not be running around somewhere else. We, we know that. There are all these things. Um, one of the great old teachers said, uh, people asked him, did he have a miracle? And he said, yes, I do. Which was kind of always a good thing to say yes to. <laughs> and he said, uh, they said, well, there's a, a guy down the road who who has miracles and walks on water and things. He says he walks on water and things like that. Oh, very good. And um, yes, I do have a miracle. What's your miracle? He said, when I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm tired, I sleep. When I hear the bell, there's just the bell. People said, that's not a miracle. And he said, almost nobody can do it. They lie down to sleep and they've got a million things going on. They're eating, they're trying to get on to the next bite. <laughs> they're comparing the food. When I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm tired, I sleep. When I hear the bell, there's just the bell. I am the bell. <laughs> I was just looking at uh, Death sent me a chat saying, can't hear bell. Original sound, question mark. And when I asked, what is it like? What does it feel like to be here? And Amrill sent me, can't hear bell. That's what it's like. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> so the sound of the temple bell. So the koan, uh, we're working with this sort of this is a poem from the Book of Serenity, famous con collection from long ago. In front of the dead tree cliff, flowers are always in bloom. Outside the screen of luminous jewels, wind and moon are like day. So in front of the dead tree cliff, in front of the thing that never changes, you know, It's like the ancient bank where the water weed is still. The, but the flowers are always in bloom, so, you know, there's that which is always still and is vast and empty, really, of qualities. And then there's the, the blooming that always happens. The laughter and the flowers and the People getting upset and the joy and pain of it all. You know. The body that hurts, all that sort of thing. So nice being here, just so nice just feeling, feeling what it's like to be here, feeling the connection, feeling, you know, the heart open. And the heart opens when I'm not wanting or reaching or comparing. <laughs> But it happens when you're doing things to us, like, oh, I forgot to m mute people. So, so everybody can unmute themselves and make noises, which is kind of fun in a way. But then it gets, gets too cacophonous. It's nice, nice to forget things as well as remember them. Yeah. We did a session and, you know, um, that's the simple signal uh, in January, actually, which is great, you know, and uh, so deep and still. And so the um, two bells signal for walking, but now it's just a signal for talking. <laughs> so I want to show you something. Um, this is something funny. And I've been thinking about gifts, and uh, and a friend of mine um, who sort of lives down in the Santa Cruz Mountains um, and is um, uh, he's sort of turning his place into a kind of temple, and um, he's uh, putting he found a he found a place with ancient olive trees, and the I, people are rescuing ancient olive trees because some people want the land they're on for development or. Who knows? Uh, farming or something. And so, uh, but these olive trees came here long ago. They came here in, um, 
with the Spanish in the 16th century, actually, came to Peru. And then where the missions went, the, the, they tend to hop north, but they might be in Chile, I don't know. Um, Eduardo can tell us that in a minute. Are they in Chile, Eduardo? Yes. No, the ancient Seviano olive trees. They got big fruit and they're all marvelous ancient beings. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to have an expert on hand. <laughs> and uh, and so anyway, they eventually got north to California by the you know 17th century or something. And some of them are still growing, and they're these ancient beings. And because olives don't have a tap root, then that's not you can you can lift them up and transport them if you've got a big enough truck and forklift and things. So. So uh, he said, do you like olive trees? I said, I just love olive trees. And in fact, I've plant, we've planted a few on our place, a few young olive trees. And, uh, and he said, how about I get you an ancient olive tree? <laughs> and said, it's somewhere between 150 and 200 years old. And I said, he said, do you have room for it? And I said, we will find a way. <laughs> so it was great. So he, he uh, sends me an ancient olive tree. And uh, with this wild guy, and so I'm going to show you the tree. And it's sort of really an ancient being, um, with like it's got like four four different bowls and trunks and things like that. Can you see that? Not yep. Thank you very much. And uh, so it's kind of an amazing ancient being, and uh, it's been shortened quite a lot, so it won't go over in the wind, and then. For, probably for transport, but still it's like being with chi, you know. So, uh, and then I'll show you. Then there's a whole thing about, so naturally I looked up, there's a whole thing about ancient olive trees. And uh, here's one, 3,000 year old one from Crete. So that's really the, the mama of your olive trees. <laughs> but you can tell. Ours is headed in the same direction, it's just got another couple of thousand years to go. You know? <laughs> so it's rather wonderful to be sharing with, uh, sharing life with this ancient being. And so, um, and so, but then it was an adventure. And what came to me about gifts are an interesting part of life. When someone just gives you a gift and just to, that life is a gift. And so just to accept it, it's a bit like just hearing the bell and not, not wanting anything from it, not wanting, um, it to mean something, it's just the bell, you know. So like the flowers in spring, the fl in front of the dead tree cliff, the flowers are always in bloom, like gifts. It's gifts all the way down, you know. So, um, <laughs> and so, and my friend says, ah, oh, you know, the guy who has the olive trees, you know, he takes them getting used. <laughs> and so then I get this, this like text with, there's a, with a, a picture of an 18 foot long forklift, uh, it's a tractor with a forklift on a cat. And he says, the guy says, so do you have one of these? And I said, well, I don't happen to have one lying around. <laughs> oh, I'll have to rent one. So he rents one. Then I get a, a note saying, send your homeowner's insurance to this forklift rental place, you know. And I said, I can do that. But um, and he said, endorse it. To get them endorsed, and I'm like, so I call my insurance agent who says, on what planet would I take responsibility for a rented forklift? <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's a very, like, earthy kind of person. Loves the royal family. <laughs> so anyway, that's, her, thing. that's her, her imaginative thing. But anyway, so she's very amused about, ha, if he runs into your house, we'll repair the house, but we're not going to look after the forklift. Okay, so I tell him that, and he, oh, well, it's going to cost all this extra money. And so I said, well, if it does, it does, you know, but it turned out nothing. And so there's all these, like, things, you know, do we need to get soil amendment? And then he asks some other strange question and so on. So, so anyway, he's, uh, he's got this negotiating style that's sort of very streety. And so if you ask a question, he jams you with another question. So it was kind of fun getting used to that, you know. And I, so I said to my friend, my friend said, he's high strung. And I said, he makes everyone high strung. Yeah. And, uh, and then my friend said, it's a great thing. And he said, yeah, it's been a sort of practice in a way. He said, it's like the, the you know, waves keep falling on the sand and they, 
the little particles of sand fly up and run around and wash out and come back and the beach starts to worry it's not a beach. <laughs> but in the end, the waves are just the waves and the beach is still the beach. <laughs> so it was like that whole way of how people can make you, you know, just start being crazy and fly apart. I thought it was rather fun. I said, oh, that's very wise. Thank you. I had to take out the fence and cut down big posts and things like that. And then, then we've got a guy standing on a ladder holding up the the Wi-Fi wires so that the tree can get up with a rake <laughs> so the tree can get underneath and so we had like the Wi-Fi wires all the slack was taken up on this pole and had it cut the tie and so on but without harming the wires so anyway there's a lot of elaborate stuff and then he gets ready to go in naturally the forklift bogs and it's a huge thing it's like as I said 18 foot long and weighs 10 tons or something <laughs> and uh, so so and so he would drop the he'd push the tree ahead with his forks, which are hydraulic, then pull them back and then we put boards under the forklift and then he'd run over that, get up to the tree, lift it up again, bog, and then push it forward with his forklift. And so we're just pushing it forward and forward and forward. And it took, you know, I don't know, over an hour to just get across the yard because <laughs> it's been so wet and it was bogging. And I decided, oh, it was kind of fun. It might as well be fun, right? <laughs> and the guy and I started getting along really well, and the, the couple of guys who work with us were great, you know, very gracious about it. And everyone had been gracious with him, suddenly he became gracious, so it was great. And uh, so that's the thing about gifts. And I was thinking about, um, you know, the, all the, the things about gifts, and I was thinking, I started, so I started thinking about the old... Um, there's something something kind of important about when somebody offers you a gift to say yes if you can as long as you don't think there's barbed wire attached to it you know and uh, there's something rather wonderful because it's outside it's outside the usual ways we trade and do commerce and things like that and I do something for you so you'll do something for me and things like that and so uh, there's something sort of free and open and something it's like the sound of the bell a gift, you know, and um, and you're appreciated. And so with the tree, what else has been happening is that um, uh, uh, a couple of people just happened to email me and said, what have you been doing? And I sent them photos of the tree. And um, the two people notably were um, Nazneen and Michael Wilding. And, um, <laughs> and so they both sent me songs. In, in response, and one was in Bangla, and the other one was Michael's composition. And so I went out and played them to the tree. <laughs> so, so I'm standing out there with my iPhone playing things to the tree. And I thought the tree kind of appreciated that. It's sort of in a new place and it's trying to work it, <laughs> work it out. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I thought, oh, and that's a people, I thought, oh, that's a kind of nice way to relate to the tree. I just take music out and slows my day down, play with the tree. And I've been checking in with it every day. Yeah, so I want to say that. And then the other thing, I started thinking about uh, long ago, I was in um, the islands off Papua New Guinea in the the north side of the Coral Sea. And uh, I was uh, and I was the guest of uh, the chief of the village, you know, through no fault of my own. I just happened to know somebody who was a good friend of his. And who's an artist, and um, uh, but everything there was no power, there was no anything there, but but they had a, a kind of um, the ancient gift cycle, the cooler cycle was still going, and I, that was a remarkable thing. And I, I just thought I'd just mention it a tiny bit, where I was taken into you know uh, the hut of uh, the, the the chiefs sister's son was going to be the next chief because it was a matrilineal culture so that's how it went and so i was he he it was also his obligation to take me around and swan me around and thing and um although the chief would come and talk to me the old chief would come and talk to me sometimes but they had these these bits of jewelry and there were armbands and there were neck plates with red tiny red shells around them the armbands were big white shells you know and they were this hugely important thing. They were the most valuable thing in the village, you know, worth more than a house and things like that. And 
and what you had to do with your your valuable piece of jewelry was you had to get a, a crew of people in a canoe and go off trading and you had to go to the in this very ritualized way you had to go north with one of them and south with the other and and, and you, you would go with one it would say your armbands i think went north i can't remember really but um and uh, <coughs> in your canoe and you waited till the weather was good and you went to the next island in the chain and then you handed over you had a trading partner who was probably a chief or something there and you handed over your your armband and there was a lot of thing about how you know there's a lot of theater about this of course on the beach of look we are giving you this most valuable thing and uh, and you couldn't accept anything in, in re return for it though but and then when you got the armband you could have it for about a few months but if you had it for more than that people would start to you start to get a bad reputation so you had to send it on to the next island around the chain and eventually it or something of equal value and power in a force would come back to the original person who sent it off and there'd be th things going but uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise around the, the island chain there's about 16 islands in the chain so it was a kind of amazing strange thing where the most valuable thing in the village had to be given away you couldn't and as well they would take other things to trade whatever they wanted to trade you know tools or yams or <laughs> whatever you know and so the trade would happen but it wasn't about this and and uh it's a very complicated thing and there's like a lot of um uh there's there's a lot of um maneuvering and social stigma and things like that if you don't do it and stuff like that but uh I, I thought it was remarkable, and I still think it's remarkable. It's been written. It was written up by Malinowski, an anthropologist, in the twenty about hundred years ago, and um, uh, and still a very interesting thing called the Kula Ring. So I just wanted to say that, and in a way that the, the whole island had that quality of you know they just uh, put up strangers and, and very hospitable and, and and so on. So so, and I wanted to read. Uh, the other thing I want to read here is um, this is Denise Levitov's poem called The Gift. Just when you seem to yourself nothing but a flimsy web of questions, just when you seem to yourself nothing but a flimsy web of questions, you are given the questions of others to hold. In the emptiness of your hands, you are given the questions of others to hold in the emptiness of your hands. Songbird eggs that can still hatch if you keep them warm. Butterflies opening and closing themselves in your cupped palms, trusting you not to injure their scintillant fur, their dust. You are given the questions of others as if they were answers to all you ask. Yes, perhaps this gift is your answer. You're given the questions of others as if they were the answers to all you ask. Yes, perhaps this gift is your answer. Kind of nice, nice run at Cohen study. And it's also the, the bits of sand, you know, that we call the self, you know, <laughs> flying around the beach. So, um, and uh, the other couple of things about those islands is... Um, I don't know. Uh, I got very sick when I was there, you know, which happens often, just eating food and stuff, you know. But um, I remember just drifting around in a canoe one day, and uh, I went out in a canoe and then got really sick. I remember drifting around, people just keeping track of the canoe, and occasionally a head would appear over the side where people were fishing and diving, actually. And they'd check on me and then off they'd go. So it was kind of fun <laughs> being sick, being somewhat delirious. It's a good place to be delirious. And the uh, and they also lived where the, the, the kind of forces were different. Like I remember the old chief starting to explain the winds. It was really important to explain the directions of the winds and the, the wind that blew to the north, you know, and the, the north wind that you took when you went south on your tra voyages. It was great, and they had these great canoes. But the most important and beautiful thing was, <clears throat> he said, um, uh, the splashboards of the canoes, which were on both sides, and they're just a, a big board, but elaborately carved in sort of Melanesian, you've seen them in Polynesian things, style. And um, he, the chief was, was famous for being a great artist of carving the canoes, the canoe prowls, and that was a great thing to do. And he said, 
it really, he showed me a, a, car, a, a canoe prow, he said, there's no, it, it had this uh, word called water in their local language, it was called, and he was using that word, sopa, and he said, there's no, no water in that. <laughs> there's no flow, there's no Tao in that. And you could see it was all awkward and they'd just done the, by the rules and so it was rather wonderful. They had this wonderful as a con conception of art and all. And he did tell me one of the other things that was probably worth remarking. He said that I shouldn't talk to the bats. <laughs> Which I thought was rather wonderful because he said they were the messengers from the dark chief, the rival chief up in the mountains. He was the, he was the chief down at, on the ocean with the canoes and there was a dark chief who was a magician also up in the mountains and he would, if you'd find bats following you, they're just like trying to get information for the other chief, don't talk to them. <laughs> so it was rather wonderful. So, um, so in fact, I didn't talk to the bats. Although I don't, I don't, I feel I can talk to the bats around here if I wish. So yeah. So uh, I want to sit a bit and um, just feel, you know, just feel what it's like just to be in the now. Really, yeah. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. Amazing thing to have what we have to have this without closing our hands on it because it's, it's always with us and we can't get away from you know the flowers on the dead tree cliff the flowers are always in bloom Letting the meditation come to you, you know. Forgetting the self, you unite with all things, as an old Japanese teacher used to say. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to unite with the 10,000 things. But all we have to do is just be here. <laughs> Just forgetting the self in spades of the dead tree cliff. The flowers are always in bloom. In front of the dead tree cliff, flowers are always in bloom. Outside the screen of luminous jewels, wind and moon are like day. Everything is clear. Not in a hurry to move somewhere else, because the whole <coughs> universe is here. And then, it, so there's a great patience comes with that, and the whole just being here itself. Then we are carried. The current carries us. We are on the journey. without moving our arms and legs at the moment, just here. There are flowers blooming.
In front of the dead tree cliff, the flowers are always in bloom. The flowers. Spirit is always spring. <clears throat> in front of the dead tree cliff, the flowers are always in bloom. <clears throat> you notice with a koan something in you, it, it touches something, it, it greets you and encounters you and something uh, becomes alive in you. Each moment of Zazen <clears throat> somehow deepens us and heals us on the journey. So you don't have to think you don't have to assess any given moment because assessing is always standing outside it. You don't have to rank it or come to conclusions about yourself. But you can trust that, oh, I'm being, I'm being carried. This is the great journey. And wherever we've been, is not here now, and whatever we've done is not here. Whatever we've achieved or lost is not here. Any achievements or joys or any sorrow or disgrace is not here now. Everything is complete. The flowers are always in spring. The flowers are always in spring. Somehow, this time of year, I always have a, a, a short poem or two, so I'm just going to inflict them on you <laughs> and read them. The, this is a drink session. The moon is obscured, the night dark, the owl is quiet, a few frogs sing. Only the wind and the intermittent rain remember us from before. Only the wind and the intermittent rain remember us from before. This can't make up its mind day. The sun and the rain on the King Alfred Duff's vines budding like mad. But as it so often did in that era, the day jumped inside the old bent plum tree and only a small hole in the grey bark remained. If you peered in, there they were, the little oddly shaped pieces of previous life like coloured glass, falling onto the abundant, the green, the knee-deep grass, where the crow walked under the feet of the deer and ate and ate until it was night. Asking the apricot tree, at dawn, still awake, I ask the apricot tree, Did you dream last night? I did. 
I dreamed leaves in the moon. I dreamed I flew. So that's what the apricot tree has to say. So, <laughs> so Tess Beasley, do you have anything to say about where you are, what it is? <laughs> what is it? The thing I kept thinking of during meditation was um, you all this talk of gifts and the passing of the beads around the island. So I was thinking about really small children when they first realize that they can give you something, and especially when it's something they love, and there's this incredible delight in offering it to you and you accepting it. And then this moment of, do I really want to be without it or not? And then what, <laughs> you, what you realize is they actually want to share it. It's just that like they, they have such joy or they know this is a, a thing that makes someone happy. And so they want you to have it, but they want to share it too. And somehow after Michael was playing, I was just thinking like, it's so much the spirit of the Dharma in a way that like I, I, you know, so much of the tradition got passed down because I feel or I see or I notice something and I want, you know, I want you to feel it and see it and notice it too. And there's this kind of, um, I was thinking about the, the koan and the, the flowers in front of the dead cliffs and how there's just this, you know, you hear so often of the Dharma as this inexhaustible gift, this inexhaustible resource that's just being passed along. And it just feels like, I don't know, that's what we're doing. We're those little kids, we're those masters, we're those something that are <laughs> passing it along. So around the islands. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. There's something strange about that. It's got to go around all the islands and then comes back and it's got to go around again and you can't keep it for long. So I still haven't quite worked out what all, all about, you know, I guess it's not workable out, but it's, it's a strange, interesting thing. And people say, I saw a video of people setting off in the canoes, which are, they have one outrigger and they're a big ocean going hunk of log. And, and uh, the chief took a long time showing me over his canoe and the splashboard and they got a big carved splashboard with at each end with geometric you know maori looking actually in a way shapes and colors and things and see them setting off and there are people who are late and they're running and swimming out the canoe and jumping aboard and the paddlers are paddling and the, and the uh, people are laughing and and people are singing them off and things. so it's, it's a great wild kind of scene of these people who have no money and know anything really. So it's, uh, it's lovely. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Todd Geist, do you have anything to say? Went for a walk in the green, uh, green fields below Boney Mountain this morning. And uh, now I'm home. My body is pleasantly stiff and warm. Very good. Yolanda Sanchez just mentioned that Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, has a lot about this kind of consciousness. And uh, actually, he does mention the, the Kullering and the Trobian Islands there, Malnowski's work. Um, it was very fleeting, a fleeting mention. But, but um, yeah, that. So um, thank you, Todd. Allison, wherever you are. I guess we got a couple of Allisons. This one's Allison Atwell. Are you around? I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking of the gifts being handed on and then not not seeing um, where they end up. You know, not knowing that some that passed on, but not directly, like with the child to you. Uh, the whole saga of the ancient olive tree. Um, the the very um, uh, uh, sort of difficult and high strung a uh, person who delivered it he kept texting me even though I would ask him to text John and they'd be firing these texts at me and uh, he was very much like like a rescue Jack Russell or something you know just like racing around and barking and I would ask him a question I'd have to ask it like five five times need to answer a different question or make demands that I call him. And I kept saying, sorry, I'm in a meeting, text me. You know? <laughs> I thought it wouldn't be good to speak to him personally. 
but but by the end, by the time that the morning he was going to come and deliver the tree, um, it had been all arranged and everything worked out. And by then, there was he was sending me these very charming, um, sort of easy tone in the in the texts, and I had for some reason some some bit of fate. I ended up having an emergency dental appointment exactly when he was <laughs> arriving. So the, you know, the, the forklift had come and the crew had come, but just as I'm pulling out of our driveway, I see coming up the road, this giant olive tree. And I am so happy not to be there. And <laughs> I drive off to my dentist appointment and, um, while I was there, I was thinking, oh, God, I wonder what's happening. I wonder how it's going. I'm so glad I'm not there. And when I finally return and, and pull into the house, apparently he had just left. The fence had been completely um, demolished and then reassembled by the time I got back. And the whole yard was really torn up and... Uh, like, you know, I don't know, like some sort of battlefield. You could tell some really amazing struggle had occurred here. And then the olive tree, it really changed the feeling of, and actually I'm looking at it right now. I can see it. It's directly outside my studio on the edge of the yard there. And it looks like a dinosaur. It looks like it's lived so long, it doesn't quite belong in this era. Like it's it's older than the time that it's in, in some, uh, like a living fossil kind of feel. And all the trees around it are now, they've sort of turned towards it and um, like gathered around, like children around, um, I don't know, or maybe like disciples around the Buddha where they're just now sort of listening to it as it's telling its stories. And then the other day, I, I, see, I see John out there and he's just, I don't know what he's doing. He's doing something though. <laughs> and then I ask him about it and he's just, um, he's playing, as he said, he's playing music to the tree. <laughs> Let's try the other Allison. Where are you, Alison McCabe? Here you are. Yeah. Oh, I loved that olive story. I, I um, olive tree story. I was feeling the um, Michael's playing, Wildlings playing today. The saxophone. It, it's kind of ebbing and flowing like my thoughts. And then I think it's a harmonium. I'm not sure what that bass is, but it it's sudden, I, just this image of it being a gift to me of my lungs filling and emptying and filling and emptying and like that. <laughs> Thank you, excellent. You know, everything comes through us and ev everything in the world comes through us, you know. We are that which comes to us. Let me see, is somebody on here? Eduardo Fuentes, you want to say anything? Yeah, I was very impressed by uh, a movie I saw about um, a huge, immense park they want to do in Patagonia. I think I shared it with PCI people. But the thing that they didn't say there is that this was a gift from an American. The man was called Douglas Tompkins. Mm -hmm. He came with a conservation idea to Chile and Chileans could not understand it. And he started buying land and Chileans could not understand why was he buying land? What was, was he trying to build another nation? Was he trying to build something for Israel or the CIA or whatever? <laughs> And so they were so surprised that at the end, he gave it all away to the Chilean uh, state to make a huge park throughout Patagonia. Hmm. And it was a gift that he, was, <clears throat> he, he wasn't recognized for. People here could not understand it. We don't have a, 
a philanthropy tradition. So they couldn't understand what, he, what, what does he want? What's he trying to do? <laughs> Just giving it to us a gift. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You must want something. It's the Jews. You know. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's great. Thanks. That's really a beautiful, touching story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michelle Riddle. I think you're on here somewhere. You were on here anyway. Yes. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. I don't usually use these. Um, I was thinking when you were, well, just thinking about gifts, I have a couple of things. Um, gifts, ex I was thinking about how some of the most sort of memorable gifts I've received are gifts that asked something of me, um, kind of like your olive tree. You accept the olive tree and in turn, you have to care for it and you play it music and you water it. And it's when I was young, somebody gave me a gift of um, a self-defense course, uh, but they only paid half the cost. And at the time I thought, what kind of gift is that? Like <laughs> you give me half a self-defense course. Um, but I decided I accepted it and I found the way to get the rest of the money and I paid the money. And it was an incredibly like moving experience. And there is something about um, the a gift that it doesn't just land on you, but when a gift is often something that then asks for your involvement and participation and, and just how, I don't know how important that can be sometimes even. Um, yeah. It's just one of the things that keeps it's, it's, it's a way we're carried. Um, also unexpected gifts are so wonderful when someone gives you a gift and you're not expecting one, there's no occasion, um, you know, and likewise to give one that way. Um, and I think I just wanted to say too, the thing you said, you were talking about, you don't have to assess um, each moment, you know, um, and how, and I started thinking about just the, a huge presence of assessment. Even when I come and I sit down to a Sunday program at first, just all kinds of things come up um, about assessing how, how, how's it going? How am I doing? At my job, it's nothing but assessment, morning, noon, and night. And the sense of healing and relief that comes from sitting down quietly and letting that go, you know, which is what I feel like I can do in Zazen and sometimes also just talking about the Dharma and being with, with friends in that world. It really is so tremendously healing. And um, I don't know. So I just, that um, it's, for me, it never ends that constant sort of returning to not assessing. And there's just something amusing about it how how much assessment is everywhere and underneath it is this non-assessing so anyway that's what's on my mind thanks very good thank you glad i asked jesse carden i think nothing for me thanks very good <laughs> is that good or bad <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. Marianne Burris. You're in Africa by the look of it. I am. Mm -mm -mm. I am. I'm in Nairobi. Um, I like what Michelle says about um, gifts, the, the, the big gifts being something that you have to nurture on and on. One of my favorite gifts was years ago, I was given a wooden spirit house by a Thai friend and 
taught by her grandfather how to take care of it. It has a Buddha in it and you have to have two elephants and it can't be in a shadow. And it's where I do my puja. It's where I do my prayers. And um, on Sundays, I sweep it out with my little, um, um, I have a little ostrich feather fan. And, and this just this morning, I was really struck because we're in a terrible drought here right now. There are planes named dying everywhere and the earth is cracked. And, and yet when I collect the flowers for the spirit house this morning, as I do most days, um, there's always something blooming. There's always a bloom. So that circle of where you started with the, the blossoms and, and the gift um, yeah, it really, I feel that. Thank you. Very good. The climate, the fate of the earth, and the beauty that we have even inside it all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's sit a little more, eh? Couldn't hurt. We'll have a bit of that healing. Uh, the healing of not assessing things. The Tony Hogan said, uh, "Not to when he was dying, he said not to measure anything." Yeah. <laughs> so especially yourself, but especially your friends. Feeling the expansiveness of the time, you know, it's in your heart, it's in the whole world. If it's in you, you're sharing it with everybody, just breathing. Good to know. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the impossible splendor of the Dharma. Beneath the cliff, the flowers are always in bloom. Outside of the screen of luminous jewels, the wind and moon are like day. The wind and the moon are like day. And everything, you know, falls away, doesn't it? I mean, we just hear, and there isn't all the other stuff. And it feels sweeter. The vastness sort of is, comes out of your own heart, your own breast. In front of the stone cliff, at the foot of the cliff, the flowers are always in bloom. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Where are we? Here. <laughs> Look around you. This is where we are. It's not so bad. The uh, each year, you know, there's a few things like always catch me every year. And apricot blossoms, one of them, this old apricot tree we have was kind of a rescue. And I don't know how I got it, but somebody, I got it in a pot and it was sort of pot bound. And so I planted it and it just didn't seem to be doing well. It just sat there for a couple of several years. And, so I thought, oh, and so then I planted, I think I thought it's going to die. I'm just going to plant an apple. And then, so I planted the apple and immediately the apricot tree took off, <laughs> inspired by the spirit of the company. And so then I, I re, I transplanted the apple somewhere else because the apricot seemed so happy. And, and 
and then it, it blossoms every year and sometimes they're like apricots and sometimes they're armed and sometimes the birds eat all the flowers and sometimes they don't. And you get a lot of apricots and you get a lot of voles eating everything else in the garden, things like that. So it's, it's a whole intense life <laughs> of its own, that tree. But it's very beautiful. The, 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 it, comes, the, it comes out in the stars, you know. It's like the, the blossoms, and, and it's one of the first things out here. And, uh, and that's the thing, thought that one does, I don't have a place to put things. They're just apricot blossoms in the moonlight. There's nothing, there's no way to say what something is or what I am or you are, you know, but there's this sort of sense of communion and participation we have together. Apricot blossoms, I can't quite make out their color, moonlight. Well, that's kind of it. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Amaryllis, oh, hold on, hang on. Amaryllis, are you ready? ready. <laughs> set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. I vow to wake all the beings of the world. I vow to set Endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Michael Wilding. Thank you, Amaryllis. And thank you everyone who spoke and didn't speak and just wonderful to be here again you know actually i don't know again but just wonderful to be here there's no comparison <laughs> so thank you